never won a Super Bowl, but mm-hmm. he did get to a Super Bowl. He was Defensive Player of the Year. He's one of the top linebackers in the NFL. His stats speak for himself. He could be a potential Hall of Famer. He's done everything except win a Super Bowl. He wants to call it a career. So be it. Maybe he doesn't agree with what Matt Rule is trying to do. Maybe he doesn't want to start from day one and uh, retire on top. And I, I this is a, a big shocker, but, you know, sometimes you got to understand, too. And I, I got a good friend of mine who does physical therapy and all that stuff, and he told me that also, keep in mind, concussions. He had a lot of concussions throughout his NFL career, and you want to get out before it gets worse. Yeah, that's where I was going with that. Here's a guy that doesn't want to find himself, you know, for the few years that he's had in pro football. And then all of a sudden down the road he's paying the price, uh, you know, with his medical situation. You know, there comes a point when you have to know when to walk away. And I guess Luke has established that this is his time to walk away. Go ahead. Well, if you want to relate it to somebody from your neck of the woods about that guy whose poster's on your wall right there, similar situation. And the same thing with Barry Sanders. Calvin Johnson retired due to multiple injuries. And, of course, the instability in that organization to get him a solid coach or just a foundation of players the way that Keekley's had. You know, I'm sure he was upset when Ron Rivera was fired. I think it's pretty safe to say that that's a similar kind of situation that's developed there. One of your stars of your franchise kind of just says, you know what, my body's already had its toll taken on it, and you guys haven't shown me enough to continue to win moving forward. I think I'm going to walk away on two feet rather than walk out in a wheelchair or cr- or be rolled out at least when I'm 35. I don't think he wants well, that. Well, if you look at somebody as a classic example, one of my dad's favorite – players of all time is Earl Campbell and it was oh, a yeah. pleasure to see Earl Campbell with a cane standing for a long period of time like he did at halftime when he was named in the top 11 college football players of all time not many people want to end up like Earl Campbell his body took a massive toll on him uh, throughout all the big time hits he dealt with all the injuries he dealt with but look football is a very dangerous sport and you just you have to find your time where you sit there and go look what is more important to me? Ask Andrew Luck that question. The shoulder injury that really hurt him the most. He felt like he got as far as he could. And then said to himself, I don't need football. I can just move on. And Luke Keekley just proved that as well. And it also goes into, you know, new establishment, new ownership. Doesn't agree with it. And, you know, move on with it. I mean, let the youngins take over from there. Because it's going to be a while for Carolina before they, you know, become that team again that Ron Rivera did such a great job building. Well, I'll go ahead and make reference to a guy that I actually saw on January 1 named Dan Deerdorf. Uh, he used to there play for the St. Louis Cardinals, and he's got uh, two canes, too. And I had an opportunity to take a photo of Dan off of the Citrus Bowl. It was unbelievable. But, yeah, yeah, again, canes, okay? We're talking canes. And, obviously, Luke Keekley was smart enough that he isn't ready to buy a cane or two. Get out while you can. Barry Sanders was on last night at that game. And the Barry Sanders, if I'm if I, my math is right, he's only in his early 50s. The guy could barely stand up. I don't know if they had chairs there, but he had to sit down. Well, Barry, I didn't know that. They were honoring the best college football players well, of all time. Well, that part I knew. Night. Why, was he having problems standing up? I think he's probably experiencing know. some knee problems. I mean, you're playing running back for 10 years. It's going to take a toll on yeah, you. Yeah, well, now he got out at the right time. If he's experiencing knee problems, I, I never know. I mean, I'm not going to mm-hmm. question the guy's injury. Don't get me wrong. Okay? Right. No, I know. But, you know, I mean, Barry Sanders has been looking good for a long time, long after his career. Now, if he's dealing with the typical aches and pains that anybody over 50 is going to deal with, that's another story. But you two guys are a long ways from finding that stuff out anyways. And I'm getting up three years away from 60. Although I'm not quite ready to get there yet. We'll just, we just hit 57. But yeah. I well, I understand that. I mean, I got a back issue that makes me think I'm a 50 year old at this point. So yeah, but your doctors, I yeah, but your doctors never said you're a 50 year old man in a 90 year old body like mine has. <laughs> but, uh, we'll leave that for another time. You got another seven minutes or so to go. Well, you want to talk right. about the uh, NFL playoffs? Go ahead. What's your take on that? Yes, real quick, um, I think uh, the 49ers really stepped up and uh, showed that they are the best defense in the, and that's left in the playoffs right now. They did an excellent job on the Minnesota Vikings. The one thing I told a lot of people was is that the Vikings, they run the rock. That is what it's going to be. It has to go through Cook, and once he had nine carries for 18 yards, it was all up to Kirk Cousins, and they knew that Cousins was not going to be able to pull it off, and that's what happened. But also, there was a lot of blame to the defense. I mean, they fired their defensive coordinator, George Edwards. They fired their secondary coach. Meanwhile, 
the 49ers are feeling it. They ran the ball 47 times on Mike Zimmer's defense at that point. And they got a terrific front seven. As for the Titans and the Ravens, I was shocked. I felt like I was watching Rocky too. And Rocky <laughs> and Apollo was the Ravens and Stallone was uh, Tennessee. And they pretty much got in there and fought it out for about 12 rounds. And the Titans really took them to pretty much to the woodshed. 30 carries, 195 yards, six and a half yards per carry. When it was the middle of the third quarter, 66-yard scamper by Derrick Henry, I knew the game was over. But keep in mind, that was a it takes a team effort to lose like that when you're a number one seed. And the Baltimore Ravens did that. It wasn't just all of Lamar Jackson. It was the special teams penalties. It was the mistakes, the lack of a running game, the inability to get the ball into the end zone, and it really cost the Ravens uh, big time. And then the Chiefs and the Texans, I felt like I was watching a Michael Bay movie. You know, at the beginning of the like the first 30 minutes, kind of all incoherent, all over the place. And it felt like that when the Texans were up 24 to nothing. But the, but the Chiefs then come roaring back. Patrick Mahomes becomes Patrick Mahomes. Five touchdowns on the day. He looked amazing, tremendous. They're loaded on every aspect of offense. And I'm excited to see what the Titans and the Chiefs can do in that championship game because this Chiefs defense is about to go against the best running back in the game to see if they can stop this walking brick wall that is Derrick Henry. And then to the Seahawks and the Packers. The Seahawks didn't have Chris Carson. They didn't have Rashad Penny. Their offensive line was banged up, and they still could not pull it out. Russell Wilson had to throw the team on his back and try and lead them to victory, but couldn't do it because everybody says, oh, the Packers are winning ugly. No, they're just winning games. They're just having defensive players stepping up when they needed to. Jair Alexander... It was 28-23, Seahawks score. Jair Alexander comes off that right side and barrels Russell Wilson into the ground to miss the two-point conversion. And then on the next drive, the Seahawks are driving. It's third down. It's only Preston Smith. Right side comes in, blitz, and sacks him. Big-time sack. Forces Pete Carroll to become befuddled and punt the ball away. And Aaron Rodgers becomes like a surgeon down the field, throwing that 32-yard pass to Devontae Adams. That nine-yard pass to Jimmy Graham to close it out. I can't wait because I feel like both of these games could either be blowouts or they could be really, really close. And I feel like the Packers and the Niners, I think that's going to be a heavyweight fight between two Titans finding it out there. And then the Chiefs and the Titans, it could be a coin flip, either a blowout or it could be close. Well, good. Save your predictions for Thursday because that's when you're going to go ahead and give them, but at least you've set it up. Go on, Lewis. I'd be glad to. If Kansas City wins and Green Bay wins, Jake, are we going to see the State Farm Bowl? Is that what we're going to call the Super Bowl this year if both of them wind up winning? Yeah, I understand the agent is going to come out and flip the coin. No, actually what we're going to see is we're going to see a rematch of Super Bowl One, the first ever Super mm-hmm. Bowl in history in 1966 when Hank Stram and Vince Lombardi were the coaches, Lenny Dawson, Bart Starr. Now you're going to have two offensive minds going at it with Matt LaFleur and Andy Reid, if that possibly happens. It'd be crazy to me that the first Super Bowl that happens happens on the 100th anniversary, a rematch of it. It could be crazy to see. But I am just glad to see that these four teams, it feels like we had the right four teams in here for a Super Bowl like this, and it's going to be amazing to see which two teams are going to be representing in Miami. Yeah, I'm the only one on this broadcast that was alive for that first one, so uh, you guys weren't quite thought of at that time. They were a pipe dream for your parents, but I was the only one that was there to watch it. <laughs> and I believe they played those Super Bowls, early Super Bowls, in January, if I'm not well, mistaken. Well, yeah, and I think one of them was at the L.A. Coliseum. Mm-hmm. Wait, January. Yep, the first one was at L.A. Coliseum. Right. They had only 60,000 uh 60,000 attending the game. It actually, you know, the, the stadium didn't look big enough. It wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't until Super Bowl three was when the Super Bowl became what it was because people witnessed the greatest upset right. in sports history at that point when Joe Namath beat the Baltimore Colts. They were 19-point underdogs at that point. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it all became the Super Bowl. Right. And that first uh, two Super Bowls, I think they were broadcast both on – uh, NBC and CBS because they had the respective yep. leagues is what they I were. Believe, 
Green Bay won the first two, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, they correct? Did. Yeah, right. Yes. So, yep, right. they beat Kansas City and they beat Oakland. And they won all the the NFL champion, a lot of NFL championships, as is the Colts with Johnny Unitas before that, too, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Okay, yep, Jake. Five NFL championships. All right, Jake, you wanted to uh, provide us a little bit of insights on the Houston sign stealing uh, before you uh, go off uh, – the program well, you can do that, well, and, and then we'll talk more football on Thursday. All right. Well, first off, I'll say this: the other shoe dropped as well. Uh, Boston and the Boston Red Sox and manager Alex Cora have agreed to part ways before the punishment came down uh, for Major League Baseball. I thought they look it, this. A lot of people believe it's like a slap in the wrist. I think it was the right crime for the situation. Look, everybody was treating this like it was. The biggest sports scandal in history today. And I sat there and went, it's about sign stealing. I get it. You feel jobbed. You feel like that this year should be vacated because of the cheating that the Astros did. I get that. But this was just another excuse for Yankee fans and Dodger fans who actually had to play the Astros in 2017 to whine and complain and say, oh, we... We got jobbed. We should have got the title. No, you shouldn't have gotten the title. You should have been able to find a way to beat these Astros. Yes, they had a digital technology. They used trash cans. They used clapping, whatever. But you still could not beat them. And the Astros are going to be known as cheaters in 2017. It's sad to say, but I find it as an insult that people completely took more time to whine about their team than actually talk about the crime. The crime is big. It's the biggest scandal we've had since the steroid era, and I get that. But the thing is, is that, look, I know that there are players out there that are going to say, okay, I can't give any respect to Jose Altuve or George Springer or Carlos Correa. If you really think the Astros are just going to, you know, pretty much tuck themselves between their legs and walk away, you're crazy. They are still going to be a very good baseball team coming up in this year, even though that A.J. Hinch is gone. I'm telling you right now, he may be out of a job, he's out for a year, but I will bet you money that A.J. Hinch will be hired by some other Major League Baseball team coming up in 2021 at that point. Until then, though, let's focus on what happened here, the punishment that the Astros will have to deal with the next two years. They don't have draft picks in the first and second round, and they don't have a manager. They're going to be using their bench coach, and they're going to have to just restart this franchise the best way they can, but they have so much talent. But I just found it embarrassing that people got on the phone and whined about the Dodgers not getting their way, or the Yankees not getting their way. You can, you're never going to vacate the title. They're never going to take down it. They're never going to ask for the rings back. Let's understand this. It was a terrible scandal. It is sad to say that this is happening in baseball at this point. But remind yourself. Seen, sign stealing has been happening since the dawn of baseball. Mm-hmm. Go back to the shot heard around the world, Bobby Thompson. How do you think he got that sign stealing? Somebody That's was relaying signs in center field. Yep. Exactly. They got caught. They used technology. It was cheating, and they're going to get the punishment. But sign stealing is going to continue even going into this. You just can't use technology anymore. Right. So the next time Dodger fans and Yankee fans, you want to whine and complain about this, Remind yourself of the crime before you make the crime of making it about yourself. Right, we got about a minute to go, so what do you, you want to I'll throw this number at you, Jake, that'll help kind of justify why a lot of those fans were upset. The Astros in that 2017 postseason on the road averaged 3.8 runs per game. That's like yes, on that. par with the 2013 Marlins, one of the most anemic offenses in baseball history. At home, where they had the camera, and this is where it really upsets me because Clayton Kershaw had a blow-up in Game 5 of that World Series. 8.1 runs per average in their home games that postseason. It makes a difference, and I totally understand why fans are upset. I don't disagree with you wholeheartedly, but I think those fans were kind of justified in what they were saying. Barry Bonds... I agree that they should be justified, but they completely forgot about the crime that was happening. Uh, it, It came to a point, look, I understand. The Astros cheated. I get it. They had a 273 batting average at home. They were one of the top offenses. Uh, people were talking about how they were going to be in the top five all-time teams in World Series history. Now that's all gone. Mm-hmm. But it's not a time for you to get on sports radio and whine and complain and tell if the Dodgers need to get the title or the Yankees need a rematch with the Astros. 
It's 2017. Yeah, now no one's it is advocating. Now 2020. Mm-hmm. 